it's whatever God's move is. So, um, but God's presence is in the house. It's exciting. Um, it's such a privilege just to be, um, just to be a vessel and an instrument to be used by Him in any capacity, is uh, such a such a joy. So, well, I'm going to preach now. But uh, the um, let me just share this real quick. I thought this was kind of neat. I'm not really one of those big um, gadget kind of computer kind of people, but I mean, the iPhone, it's become pretty spectacular. I've got to give it to them what they've done with that. And I, I've always been tempted, if God ever gives me a message to set a table up right here, it won't be big enough, and put all the stuff on that table that that iPhone has replaced. I mean, you, you'd, have a, you'd have a stack just with encyclopedias going way past this roof if you did that. But I recently did an um, update on my phone, and some of y'all might have um, might have done the update. But Joshua, which I was surprised, he's younger than me, and he's more into all that kind of stuff. He didn't even know what I knew, and I, <laughs> I, I was like, I'm feeling pretty good about this. I will look, I'll look, you know how your phone has all of those apps and all those little things in there. So I'm, you know, I'm always looking at that. I noticed one that, that I didn't, I didn't recognize it. So I clicked on there, and it's got a thing. Justin, I don't know if you've seen it. It's a thing you can use to measure and to tell if something's level. Has anybody seen that? On your f- it, it's unbelievable. And I'm, I'm telling you. Huh? Yeah, it, and it really works. There's a little dot that shows up, and what it does, it tells you to find the point of reference. And if you really listen, or the way my phone's set up, it has like a little click noise. So once the dot hits the point of where you want to reference the measurement, it's going to kind of click and lock in. And then you just drag the phone like on this wall, you could drag it across this whole wall, and you can measure the wall. I love that. I can't tell you how many times I'm somewhere, and I wish I had a tape measure or, or a level just to be able to. It's all on your phone now. I got my flashlight. I got my tape measure. I got my, I don't need anything else. I love it. So anyway, it's there. If you did your update, it's on your, um, it's on your iPhone. So praise God. Um, you know, if we were to follow the example of the men and women in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, there are some unpleasant questions um, Christians need to ask themselves. You may have already done this. I've, I've done this myself. One of them is this. Is what I believe in worth dying for? In other words, the gospel, the, 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 the message of the cross, the salvation that I've accepted is... Is what, I've, what I believe in, what I've placed my trust in, is that worth dying for? Next question is, am I willing to suffer and die for what I believe? And then we need to answer this question that Joshua asked the nation of Israel in, in, in the book of Joshua in chapter 24. He said, now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. Make the choice. That's a question all of us need to answer as believers. So I titled the message today, The God We Serve. The God We Serve. Joshua told the Israelites to fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully. He said, if serving Him is not your desire, then make up your mind what you're going to do. In other words, basically what Joshua was telling the nation of Israel was don't waver. In other words, don't, don't say that, that you serve God, but, but then you don't. Don't, don't waver. Make, make, up, make up your mind, in other words. Which, which direction are you going to go in? If it's undesirable to you, then, then make your choice. But, but if you've said in your heart and with your mouth that it's God, then serve God. That's what, that's what Joshua was telling them. We have, to, we have to make a choice. I've made my choice. I, I made my choice when I got saved. My, my wife and I, as a family, we've made the choice. This, this Lukinovich household says, as Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's just the way it is. Does that mean we're perfect? No, we're not perfect. 
But we've, made, we've joined a line in the sand and we've made the, the proclamation and we've made the decision and the statement is this. This household, this house is going to serve the Lord. That's just the way it is. So today, in the world we live in, as it was in the time of Joshua, uh, people are serving uh, many gods. And it, it's always uh, fascinating me when you look at the media and you look at the world in general that they'll basically uh, allow you to serve pretty much any God you want to serve. If it's, if, it's, uh, if it's Buddha, you can serve Buddha. If it's Muhammad, you can serve, you can serve Muhammad. If it's New Age, you, you can serve uh, New Age. In other words, any, any God that you choose that you want to basically say that this is my God, they, they basically give you a free pass to say, you know what, maybe I don't agree with that, but it's okay, just go ahead and do it. That even if it's worshiping trees, if, if you want to go worship a tree, go worship a tree. But you stand up and say that you are going to take a stand and you are going to worship and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, then all of a sudden it becomes completely unacceptable. Like, like okay, I can worship a tree, I can worship a mountain, I can worship the seas, worship the ocean, worship the sun, worship the moon, do all of those things. And everyone looks at you like, that's just normal behavior. But all of a sudden, you decide to say that I'm going to, you know what, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to worship like the Lord, like the creator of all these things that you're worshiping. I'm going to worship the one who created the things. All of a sudden, there's like a bullseye on your back. And as a Christian, you become like their main target. And when I say they, I, I mean the, the world in general, the, 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 the world we live in. And, and my wife and I talk about this all the time, and you, you realize this as believers. The, the world is against us. I've said that to y'all, but the, 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 the world is against believers. When you, when you take a stand for Christ, the world is against you. They're, they're opposed to you. And it comes from every direction. We, we're hated by, by the media. The media, the media hates Christians. The Hollywood, look, Hollywood despises Christianity. The, the, the government, the, the, not just the United States government, most governments around the globe, they despise Christians. Those of us who proclaim Christ as Lord and Savior, they hate you. And then for some of us, maybe even in this room this morning, the hatred comes from even your own family. You have maybe uncles or cousins or, or, or people within your own family that, that because you're a, you're a Christian, because you love the Lord, they hate you. I didn't do anything. Well, I didn't, I didn't do, all I did was accept the truth of who the Lord is and who Christ is. And all of a sudden, I become like, everybody becomes defensive and they're against me. I just stood up and accepted what the, who, who the Lord is. But the world is, a, the world is against us. See, why, why, is that, why is that the case? Why will they not accept your faith or your belief in the Lord or in Christ. Because the God we serve is the only true God. He is the Lord and there is no other. See, our faith and, and trust in Jesus brings conviction to those around us who reject it. Do you realize that? I, I experienced that when I worked at that, at the, uh, that new light, when I worked across the lake. Uh, I never... I mean, I shared my faith when God uh, gave me the opportunity to witness. I, I, I would share my faith, but I never, I never loudly proclaimed my faith in the office or walked around with a big, gigantic Bible saying, look at me, I'm a Christian, and all this kind of stuff. I didn't, but, but the, way I, the way I conducted myself, the way I spoke, uh, the, the things I listened to, the, 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 all those different things, that, that gave evidence that there, there was something different about me. In other words, they knew that there, there was something different. So just by a lot of times by the fact that I wasn't acting the way they acted caused, caused them to be convicted. That's not my fault. I, I, I'm just, don't, don't get mad at me because I've accepted the truth and all of a sudden my light, the light of Christ has exposed your darkness. Don't get mad at me. That, that's just the way it is. You see, but they, they, they despise us. That, that, that's, that's the world you and I live in. So this is the dilemma that we face as believers. Now that I've crossed the line and accepted Christ, 
Am I willing to fight for what I believe in? Am I willing to take a stand when everybody else is not? Am I, am I willing to stand for what I believe in? Or will I shrink back and serve the gods that everyone else does? Just bow down to everything else that everybody else is bowing down to. Jesus told us as believers that the choice to follow him was not going to be easy. Christ said it on several occasions, on, on, on more than one occasion, that it's a good thing if you choose to follow me, but when you make the decision or the choice to follow me, remember what it is that you're doing. And in one of the occasions, he said, um, you got to count the cost. See, I think a lot of Christians, they, they come to Christ and, and, and Mitchell was saying that about the, about the feelings, about you know, li, li, living as a feeling. And, and, and sometimes we get the feelings, but Christianity is not about feelings. It, it's exactly what, what Mitchell said. It's about the truth of, of what God says. You've got to count the cost. <laughs> There's a cost to following Christ. But the way I look at it as a Christian, fighting and contending for my faith is not an option. It's mandatory. I got to stand. Uh, I got to fight. I got I to finish the fight, as, as the Apostle Paul said. I got to run the race. I got I to gotta finish the course that God has laid out for me, and so do you. So we are, we are called to stand for the God we serve. So I'm going to look at a, at a passage of Scripture. This has always been a, one of my favorite uh, stories in the Bible, um, fascinating uh, passage. And it's in, uh, it's in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. And most of you in here will be very familiar with this story. You may have already read it at least one time. But in Daniel chapter 3, um, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon, he erected a, um, an image of gold, a gold um, image. The, the, the Bible says the image was, was 90, feet, 90 feet tall, a very, very imposing, very large uh, gold statue. And Nebuchadnezzar had sent out a proclamation to all the people in the land, every, every tribe, every language, every nation, that when the music, there was music that was going to be played, and when the music was played, as soon as you hear the sound of that music, whatever it was that they had, they had planned to play, then everybody is to bow down and worship the golden image. That, that, that was the proclamation that went out. So we're going we're gonna to pick it up there in, um, in Daniel chapter 3, uh, verses 8. Um, to 18, and I want to apologize in advance to my son Joshua for having so many verses that I'm about to read, that um, since he always gets in my case that I have too much um, scripture. <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm giving him a hard time. It says, at this time some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. There are, the, there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought, brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are not ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. What a fascinating story. 
That was three, there was three incredibly brave men mentioned in this story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you read the, the story, these men were exiles from Israel. The, uh, the, the king of Nebuchadnezzar had besieged uh, uh, Judah and Israel, um, and he had taken some of, the, some of the Israelites captive and exiled them back um, to, to Babylon. And, and if you read the beginning of uh, Daniel in chapter 1, um, the names of these three men were actually changed to these to these names, these weren't the uh, names when they when they arrived in uh, in, in uh, Babylon. But um, the, these men came; they were exiles. But they were they were strangers in a foreign land. They, the, the the Babylon land that they were living in was not was not their home. That was not that was not their land. But though they were strangers, this story tells us the Lord was not a stranger to them. He was never strange to them. They never forgot the God they served. These men feared the Lord. And comparatively speaking, if you look at the, the, the Bible and you, you read the Old Testament, the, the, the nation of Israel um, really mirrors or, or, or is an imitation of the New Testament church or the Christian church. So when you, when you, when you read the, the Old Testament and the accounts of Israel and all the things that God did for the nation of Israel, it really in a lot of ways mirrors Christianity. They, they were... Uh, 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 for all practical purposes, Christians, uh, although they weren't called that, in, in the Old Testament. So these men, they trusted God. They, they believed in the Lord. But they displayed tremendous loyalty and allegiance to who they believed in. Even in the face of the most dire of consequences, they remained loyal. See, the God they served is the same God we serve. He's the Lord Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh. He was their provider. He was the Lord Almighty. He was the Lord Creator. The, the same God that, that you and I serve, the Lord today, was the same God that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego served. So what is it that we can learn from this Old Testament story? In the, and, and we're living in 2018. We're in, the, we're in the 21st century. How can something so long ago that took place have an impact on my life? Well, it has a, it has a huge impact, I believe. So... What is it that God wants to show us in this passage? The first thing is this. The God of this world is not the God we serve. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were living, they were living in Babylon. Babylon wasn't Israel. They never, they never had the Lord as, the, as their God. That wasn't the Lord that they served. They were living in an ungodly pagan nation. King Nebuchadnezzar had no fear of God. He... he he, he may have acknowledged God, but he had no fear or reverence for who, the Lord, for who the Lord was. So now these three men are living in a place that, that neglected who God was, that never feared God, that never, that never worshipped God. The, the, the pressure for them to cave in and bow down to all the, other, all the other gods around them in Babylon was enormous. It was enormous pressure for them, for them to bow down. But these men remember what the Word of God said. In Exodus chapter 20, the Lord said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. These men knew that that statue that Nebuchadnezzar erected was in direct contradiction to what the Word of God says, that God will have no other They'll have no other gods before me. Make, make no image. Worship, worship no image. Well, we too are surrounded by many idols and many images all around us that represent the gods of this world. But you and I, like, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we are not serving the gods of this world. But we are living in Babylon. Now, I want this church to know that, that if you're a Christian and you are on the earth in any place, I don't care if it's the United States, if it's Europe, any place around the planet, you are living in Babylon if you are a believer. That, that, that's the ungodly environment that you and I live in. So the gods of this world, they may not look like 90-foot gold statues, but they are nonetheless just as imposing. And, and just, just as the pressure is just as intense as it was for them to bow down and serve that god. See, what you and I have to understand as Christians, we are living in a world we don't belong in. Do, do you all realize that? The Bible says that God called us out. He, 
He, he called you out of darkness that he might bring you into light. He, he called you out for the kingdom of this world that he might bring into the kingdom of God. We, we are living in a place we don't belong. But you say, well, this is, this is where I live. Yes, this is where we live because there is no other place to live. The, the Bible says we are in the world, but we're not of the world. In other words, I'm in the world because this is where I live. I breathe, I eat, I, I, I live, I do all these things. But when the Bible says we're not of the world, it means I'm not like the world. In other words, I don't, I don't go the way the world goes. I don't listen to the things the world listens to. I, I don't speak the way the world speaks. I, I don't look at the things the world looks at. I, I, I'm surrounded by all these things, but, but I'm really... Christians are in a place they really don't... We don't fit here. You ever wonder, well, why I don't really, why I don't feel comfortable? Why I don't, because you don't fit. You, you're, 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 in a, you're, in a, you're in a depraved, sinful environment that we're surrounded with, and God has placed us in the middle of this, of, of this environment. We don't fit here. And, and that's, that's the same thing for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were living in Babylon, but they didn't fit there. Nebuchadnezzar never worshipped and honored the Lord the way these men did. But, see, we must, walk, we must walk with caution, wisdom, and discernment. you you got to walk cautiously. And just like I think it was Pastor Mitchell said this, the, uh, someone said the devil, is, he's waiting like a roaring lion, seeking who he might devour. The, the, there, there's obstacles and traps in every turn and every corner. And a lot of times the obstacle or the trap is maybe in a place we're not expecting it to be. So I have to constantly be aware. See, you're a Christian. These other people that are living in the world, they, don't, they just go along with the flow. They, they let everything happen because to them, that's just normal living. But that's not normal living for us. We go to a different drumbeat. We walk in a different direction. The path I walk in is a narrow road. It's not the wide road. So I have to walk with discernment and discretion and wisdom and, and guidance. God, Give me, let, let me be aware, let me be alert of all these different things that are out, that are out to get me because they're everywhere. See, the gods of this world, though they're false, they can be very enticing. They can look very enticing, very attractive. But the, the story we read in Daniel says a proclamation, a proclamation went out. And I thought that was very fitting for what, what we experience in the world today. The world is making a proclamation, and the proclamation is this. Bow down to what we bow down to. I don't care what gods you serve. I don't care who the Lord is or what he says or who Christ is or what the cross is. Done. I don't care. The world is making a proclamation across the whole earth. Bow down to our gods. That is going forth. And it's intense. And it's strong. And it's there. They are, they, are, they are calling us to submit to their gods. It's not enough that we leave them alone to choose the God they desire to serve. We're, we're going we're gonna to speak the truth of who Christ is, but, but I can't change the God they serve. But they're not satisfied with that. They want you and I to bow down to the same gods they bow down to. And I'm here to tell this church we cannot bow. I don't care how loud the proclamation is. I don't care how many other people around you are bowing down. We cannot. So what are, what are the gods of this world? Well, 1 John chapter 2 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. The Bible says, do not love the world or anything in the world. Now, that reference of the world is not necessarily talking about the planet or the world that we live in as much as it's talking about the ungodly systems that govern the world we live in because they're all around us. There's an ungodly government Controlled not by God, but by the devil, by Satan. It's a system of sin and lust and evil and rebellion. We're surrounded by that, the Bible says. That, that's the world that, that you and I live in. We, 
We've been called out of that world, but the, but the Bible says that God still leads us as Christians in the midst of that world. Do, do you see what I'm saying? And now the Bible is telling us as believers, don't love the things the world loves. <laughs> don't go in the direction the world goes in. Don't, don't do that. So this passage mentions three gods. I could have mentioned a hundred gods that this world has, but this, this passage, I believe, in, in three areas covers pretty much the scope of, 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 of the gods that the world, that I think are, are, are the biggest and the, the things that the world is most attracted to go into worship. The first one is this, the God of immorality. The God of immorality. It has basically become normal to live immoral. That's just basically like, you know what? That, that's just how we live. That's just what's accepted. That, that's just like, like everywhere you turn, that's like immorality in your face. Like, like even on your phone, when you're looking at a, a news article, there's, a, there's an ad that'll pop up while you're scrolling through the news article of something that I really didn't want to see. I, I, wasn't, I didn't ask for that ad to show up on my phone, but, but I'm, just looking, I'm just reading a news article. But as I'm scrolling through the news article, the ad pops in. I, I didn't ask for that. Immorality is everywhere. It's at, it's at every turn. See, the world is calling us to serve, to serve what it serves, to, to bow down to their, to their golden image of immorality. It, it's not enough that, that they bow down to it. They want you to bow also. They're not satisfied that you're not willing to bow to what they bow to. They're calling us to bow down to, to, to a spirit of lust. But see, what, what's happening in the world today, the church is being called on to compromise. That, that, that's the call that's going out, that, that maybe you won't bow down completely to the gods we serve, but we, we can at least get the church to begin to compromise. Like, this standard that y'all have set, that bar is, that bar is too high. <laughs> you got to have to knock that bar down a couple of notches. Let's just compromise a little bit. And unfortunately, there's a lot of churches in America that call themselves Christian churches. They have a cross, or maybe they don't have a cross, but they, they proclaim the Bible, but they've compromised what the Word of God says. We can't compromise. The, the Christians cannot compromise. God, God's Word does not change. God doesn't change. His standard has not changed. I don't care how prevalent uh, immorality is, we cannot compromise. See, their God is not the God I serve. That's the God they serve. That's their choice. That's what Joshua said. Make up your mind. What God is it you're going to serve? Are you going to serve the pagan gods and the land we're living in? Or are you going to serve the Lord? That's a question we have to ask ourselves as Christians living in a, in a Babylon society. What God am I going to serve? Because the gods that people around us are serving, they're not, that's not my God. <laughs> that's not the God I serve. The next 90-foot statue that the world has erected that, that they worship is the God of possessions. The God of possessions. See, you and I, we have so much, right? Maybe we have too much. I ask myself that sometimes. What's enough? Go to some of other these, these third world countries that they, they would just be excited they have running water, a, a mattress to sleep in, a, a house that's actually closed in with windows and a roof and air conditioning and electricity. What, what's, what's enough? We got too much. Yet the world says, get more. In other words, as much as, especially in America, as much as Americans have, it's like the people that we live around, they're never satisfied with what they have. It's like, what's enough? It's never enough. If it's not Christ, it's never going to satisfy. But see, that has become, that has become their God. That, that is what they... They place, they place value. That's what they place their value is on their possessions, the, the things that they own. That, that's what gives their life in a lot of ways meaning and, and, uh, and importance, I guess, is their, is their possessions. 
Is it wrong to have possessions? No. The Bible never says that, but Christ, Christ did say this. Store up treasures in heaven, not here on earth. In other words, don't let your heart, don't let your heart be drawn to the, to the possessions that the world possesses, the, the love of the things that they possess. Don't, don't have a heart for those things. Yes, I have those things. I have a house. I have a car. I have a TV. I, ha I have possessions. But what, what Jesus is saying is where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your heart? What, what do you really love? Do you love the things the world loves, the, 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 the possessions of the world? The, Jesus said, why, why let that be your treasure where, where thieves, will, they're going to break in and steal it. The, the, the moths are going to come in and destroy it. Rust is going to destroy it. Why are you wasting your energy and your, and your effort on, on earthly treasures? When, when Christ said you can place all your energy on heavenly treasures, and the Bible says those treasures last forever. That's a God. That, that's a, it might not be a 90-foot gold statue, but it's still a God. It's a God of possessions. And if we're not careful, it will ensnare us. It will get, it will get us, even Christians. The greatest thing you can possess is Christ. What does the Bible say? He's the pearl of great price. He's the treasure, He's the treasure hidden in the field. And, and then the Bible says, guess what we do? When we find that treasure, what happens? I store, it, I store it in my heart, then I go sell everything else I have, and I, and, I, and I just possess, I just have Christ. That's the greatest thing you can possess is Him. And then the next God of this world, that's the 90 foot, this might be 180 feet, the God of pride. The God of pride. See, people, people are consumed with themselves. It's amazing. They, they just, they are saturated and absorbed with themselves. It's everywhere. The world is consumed with status, with position, with their importance. See, pride seeks attention and power. It's self-seeking, it's self-absorbed, it's self-sufficient. Pride is a complete contradiction of Christianity. You have heard me say this from this pulpit before. I'm going to say it again. I probably won't be the last time I'll say it. Pride is a complete contradiction of Christianity. It's, 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 it's like if you, can't, you, can get, you cannot get more opposed or more opposite of what a Christian is than pride. That, 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 that is the complete opposite. See... It's opposed to the life of Christ himself. The Bible says that even though Christ was God, he became nothing. Christ gave us the example of humility. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that this image, no matter how tall or how imposing or how many people bowed down to it, that image was not the God they serve. <laughs> and they were not bowing down to it. The gods of this world is not the God we serve. We are loyal to one, and he is the Lord. The next thing we learn from this passage in Daniel is there can be no turning back from the God we serve. See, the story says when, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to obey his commands, he was furious. He was angry. See, the world, the world will not be happy at your resistance to their gods. And just as I said earlier, they will, they will demand that we, that we too pledge pledge our allegiance to the gods that they worship. And one of the examples I thought of with this, and y'all might have noticed this, but, and it's, it's subtle, it's very subtle, but, but in a lot of commercials, when they'll, they'll have a TV commercial or something, and they'll, they'll, show, they'll show a quick clip of like a, like a couple, like a homosexual couple in the clip, but they'll run it past it real quick. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get us to accept the fact that that lifestyle is normal, that that's accepted. Now, we love them just as we love someone that's an adulterer, that's a drunkard, that's, that's anything else. It, it's not the fact that we don't love them, but we don't accept that lifestyle. But they're not satisfied with that. They want us to bow down to the gods that they bow down to. 
Their design is to get us to turn from the God we serve, the same one that they reject. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they faced certain death. The king's order and command was very clear. Very clear. It was clear and it was immediate. If you refuse to bow down and worship the image, you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. Look at verse 15. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? So the consequences were clear, they were dangerous, and they were immediate. All Nebuchadnezzar was asking them to do was just to bow down and worship his image of gold. That's what the world says, no big deal. Just bow down to the things we bow down to. Just, just worship what we worship. Just go the way we go. No big deal. Yes, it is a big deal. The Lord is holy. The Lord is one. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. It is a big deal to God that we remain faithful to Him and to who He is. See, even though we are living in Babylon, there's no turning back. See, that, that's what you have to do. You have to have the same resolute mindset that these three men had, that even though I am living in a foreign land, turning back is not an option. <laughs> like, like quitting is not an option. I, no matter how strong the pressure gets, no matter how much the world is trying to get me to bow down and to turn away and to go the way they go, turning away from the God I serve is not optional. You have to make that decision as they did, no matter what it is you face. It could be a furnace, it could be death, it could be suffering, whatever it is. You have to understand that you, you've crossed the line, you've made your choice. The Lord is the God you serve, and Him alone. And you, you'll, never, you'll never turn back. You'll never turn back on Him. John chapter 6, listen to this. It says, so Jesus said to the twelve disciples, you do not want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You are our only hope. We have believed and confidently trusted, and even more, we have come to know by personal observation and experience that you are the Holy, Holy One of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Don't you love Peter's answer there? The Lord says, y'all don't want to leave me too, do you? And Peter gave the best answer you could ever give. He looked at the Lord and he said, he said, if we do decide that we do want to leave, where are we going to go? And that's the, that's the conclusion you have to come to as a Christian. If you're ever tempted to want to walk away from God and to want to walk away from, from, from Christ, ask yourself this one question before you make your decision. Where are you going to go? In other words, what direction is there to go in once you've found Christ? Once you've found salvation, once you've found forgiveness, once you've found eternal life, once you've found, as Peter said, our hope, our confidence, what direction are you going to go in? What else is there other than Christ? There's no turning. In other words, there's no turning back. I don't care how intense it gets. Men and women in the Bible suffered. They suffered for what they believed in. But they were willing to suffer and die for it because I knew that it wasn't just what they were experiencing here on the earth that was temporary. It was an eternal salvation that God had given them. There's no turning back for us. Let, let the government, let the world do what the world's got to do. I'm a Christian. I serve God. That's the God I serve. There is no turning back. We must respond as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. Look what this said in verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, listen to this, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the burning furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, look, and I've always noticed this when I've, when I've read this story, I've read this passage. Look at the way these three men responded. Now, remember, 
he said, if you don't bow, it's not going to be like we're going to give it a week or two weeks or a month to kind of think about this. If you don't bow now, the furnace is already lit. You will be put, placed in the furnace today. This is going to happen like now. There's no like second chance. This, this is your fate. Notice how calm and deliberate and th they were just like confident and just, they just answered the king with such, such calmness. In other words, they were already resolved in their mind of, of the answer that they were going to give. They weren't arguing or just like they said, we don't need to defend ourselves. They were very calm and very resolute. They were telling the king, do, do what you must do. do. Worship the God that you must worship. But even if we are thrown into the furnace, we will not bow. But listen to the most intriguing line that they gave. The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up for us. That's the key phrase, I believe, into this, in this whole story. But even if he does not, we will still worship the Lord our God. Some of you in here that are facing tough situations, you need to receive that today in Jesus' name. I believe that one phrase will set somebody free in this church today. That no matter what it is you're going through in your life, whether God comes through or God doesn't come through, whether God answers the way he wants us to answer or he doesn't answer the way he wants us to answer, let, let, even, even if he does not, we will never bow down. See, God is, is the Lord regardless of my situation or my circumstance. It, it doesn't matter what I'm facing or what I'm going through. It doesn't change who God is. And that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood. That yes, we're facing certain death. We will die. We're not bowing. So we basically already accepted the fact. But they made sure Nebuchadnezzar knew that our God, the God we serve, the God we serve... He is more than able to take care of this, this fire you got set, this, 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 this little furnace you got over here. My God can handle this furnace. He, he's got that. But we want you to know this, King Nebuchadnezzar, even if he doesn't do it, which he can if he wants to, we will not bow. What a, what a revelation for us as believers, right? That, 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 in other words, that's a Christian. In other words, Yes, I want God to move. Yes, I want miracles. Yes, I want all these things to happen in my life. But even if God doesn't do what I want him to do, see, I, I want God to do these things, what I want God to do, even if he doesn't do them, he's still Lord. See, that's what we have to, we have to understand. You have to, be, you have to be resolute just as they, as they were. See, whatever does or does not happen in my life, it will never change who the Lord is. Everyone around you may be bowing, but like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will still be standing. Imagine what that looked like. They were the only three. It doesn't, the story doesn't indicate anybody else was standing except them. M imagine what that looked like. I don't know if it's hundreds, thousands, or whatever. All these people on their knees worshiping this gold image, and you got these three men just standing up. That's what we'll look like when we don't bow down to the, to the, to the gods of this world. We're, we're just standing. But God is the Lord, whatever I'm confronted with. I may ask right, and then the common. Um, Mitchell can, can be released to play the drums. Um, we're going to play you on the inside, if that's all right. Is that all right? <laughs> oh, we can do it. Oh, I like that one, too. That's good. I like Psalm 139 says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. No matter where we go, we can't escape God's presence. The God we serve is the God of the hills and the valleys. Do you know that? Whether you're on the mountaintop or you're in the deepest, darkest valley, 
the God I serve is still in control. He's still Lord. And He's still worthy of our worship and our allegiance. Stand to your feet. We're going to... We're just going to close with this song. I'm just going to ask you just to just to come to the front. And let's let's close the service today by worshiping the God we serve. Don't you think that would be appropriate? And we'll we'll, we'll conclude the service with this song as you come forward to finish the the song. And then this uh, message uh, is going to be continued next week with part two. That's the, the best part of the story is yet to come in chapter three. So, but um. Let's just, let's just close by worshiping the God we serve and then you just